McCulloch had been working on neural networks, maybe the first, and he had a little group of, he had a 14-year-old prodigy named Walter Pitts in Chicago, and they worked out this paper that was published in 1943, so that's many years before uh, Norbert Wiener came on the scene. And he had been a psychiatrist, a physician, neurologist, really, and started the neuroscience laboratory at MIT and was a very dramatic <clears throat> world-class actor figure and I went on trips with him and and uh, it gave me a new view of the world because when McCulloch, I remember one day he said, I'm going to explain something to the psychologists and he had a sort of grand view of of this, the importance of cybernetics, which was correct, so otherwise you would have said he was delusional. And so I went with him, and it was a little meeting with about six or seven people. But he was on the stage, and I realized he was talking to the whole world. Normally people are talking to their audience, but uh, he would have very elaborate constructions and beautiful ways of saying things. But I'd never met anyone who, for whom... All the world was a stage, you could, I think, some, as someone put it. And <clears throat> uh, from that, I got some sense that you shouldn't waste people's time with things that aren't very important. Of course, nobody, nobody could live out such a commandment, but I must have spent most of a year just hanging around him and trying to understand how he could see such importance in ordinary things. So in a way, it's like Feynman who look at a little wave on the water and understand how the universe works. And McCulloch was very much like that for psychological things. He, in retrospect, he had the first society of mind because it wasn't just the conscious and the unconscious, but he also had these sensors and uh, whatever. Anyway, that was a about a year when I got attached to this McCulloch and somewhere I wrote that maybe a hundred years from now he will be the seen as the greatest 20th century philosopher. What I am trying to do as a scientist is a very simple and clear-cut story. It begins back about 1917, I was then about 19 years old. I had been brought up with every expectation of going into the Christian ministry, which in my family means the Episcopal Church. I was soaked in theology. This is Dr. Warren McCullough, an eminent neurologist, engineer, and mathematician. It was at his world-famous lab at MIT that the original work on the frog's eye took place. And I got seduced by mathematics. Surely because there was more fun in it, and because if you know theology at all well, you'll realize that the ideas in the mind of God are mathematics and logic. So this is the way I came into the game in the first place. And I have never had but one question in the whole of my scientific life. I've only wanted to know what is a number that a man may know it, and a man that he may know a number? I think I'm fairly clear as to the first half of it, but as the second half, a man that he may know a number? Mm -mm, not yet. I've had to content myself with what a frog's eye tells a frog's brain, or something else of this sort. So roughly... A frog's eye is very simple compared to a man's brain an organ so complex that even the most optimistic believe that it will be centuries before we unravel all its mysteries. Yet, Dr. McCullough and his colleagues 
believe they are beginning to understand how the higher nervous system, a man's brain, might work as a machine. A machine basically different in principle from anything we can now build, much more subtle than even our most sophisticated computers. Now, may I make clear a distinction between your nervous system and any computing machine which is yet in existence. Uh, there are some beginning to approximate it. Uh, they are to be found chiefly in bombers and things of this sort. Now, in <coughs> an ordinary machine, <coughs> operations are carried out sequentially. And a mistake entails mistakes which follow inevitably from it all the way through the computation. As opposed to this, there are parallel machines, that is, machines which carry on the same computation in one, two, three, or more channels. Compare the results and don't go ahead until the results agree. These are strictly parallel. I'm not talking about either of these kinds of machines. I'm talking about machines which resemble, let's say, the mouth of the Danube, or the mouth of the Nile, or better yet, the mouth of the Swanee River. These are what the Greeks called anastomotic affairs. That is, the water from each contributory stream is mixed with the water from every other contributory stream before they finally get out the mouths of the river. Is that clear? There is no other word that I know for it except the old Greek word anastomotic. They're not merely braided together where the braids follow through. No, no. They're braided with an intermixture so that the information coming out at any one point in the mouth is combined from the information coming in from all of the sources of that river. Is this clear? Good. What is more, well, any man my age knows this very well. Neurons die at the order of thousands of neurons per day. We're built to run well to the 16th year of age, roughly. From that time on, you begin to be able to count the holes where there were cells and there are no more. So, you have to design it so that a cell, while it's a dying, and while it's a dying, it's apt to go pip, 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 and then quit. And uh, after it's dead, it's not going to make too much difference you would probably find at least 10% of the big cells in my cerebellum, where you could count them, are just holes filled up with glia, glue cells, supporting cells. So, this kind of thing happens all the time and must happen. And yet we can go on to, well, in my family, to 100. And the, the theory that you're working on... The theory that we're working on takes care of all of these things. That's the important point about it. No, I would expect that insofar as machines might survive man, they might, they would only carry on, in a sense, the same direction, same general direction, that man would have carried on if he could have. Am I clear? so to speak, the machines would be standing on our shoulders. Somehow the purpose that, that uh, a machine, no matter how complicated and how clever, could have, to my mind, isn't equatable. When man has gone, these machines would, in essence, be purposeless. I doubt that. I would say, in essence, they would be purposeful. And there would be, in your feeling, nothing gone and nothing missing from the world. Well, you mean in the sense in which the dinosaurs are missing? No, I mean in the sense of something important. Well, aren't they important? Weren't they important? I mean, th there's one thing you could be pretty sure of, man won't survive forever. From all that we know of the sun and of other stars, that would be the most improbable thing. Something else will come. 
and in your opinion, it might be something of man's own creation. Yes. Well, here's the, here's the problem that I'm trying to get at. Here's the thing that I'm trying to get at. You have two grandchildren right there. And I can't see that a machine will ever feel toward any of its Why not? creatures the way you feel about them. That's the one thing that I can't get. Well, I think I could set it up for you because I'm certain that if I do it, there is a mechanism that can do it. If I can manage to state that in a finite and unambiguous manner, then uh, I think it can be done. And I see no reason why we can't develop a logic of relations in time to come. Granted, it's defective at the present time. Don't shake the table. <laughs>